the quarterfinals are set so let's pop that up so if you don't know the matchups yet we're going to get into that and we'll definitely look back at what has been an interesting uh, round of 16 nigeria the highest ranked fifa team left at the 42nd ranked team in the world playing the lowest team and angola cape verde takes on south africa who shockingly took out morocco of course from the world cup semifinals last time mali and ivory coast neighbors and the host in the ivory coast and the uh, dr congo taking on guinea as well um we said it was unpredictable. Let's pop up Ed's. You know, we got to the bracket in the round of 16 here, Ed. Just started out. You know, you had a couple right here. How do we feel about your performance? Because it's it was chaotic, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, look, this wasn't my finest hour, this uh, round of 16 <laughs> predictions. I think that's that's fair to say. I think, I don't know what the pass mark was, but I think 50% of, of teams correctly predicted isn't terrible. I think it's possibly slightly better than, than Colin. Uh, which is all that matters and i think it's it's testament to the unpredictability of, of the tournament you, you know you, you said it before we haven't seen an afcon before where uh, there have been this many surprises this many big teams this many heavyweights have fallen so early on uh, and the shocks of the group stage continued to, to the last 16 which was an absolutely engrossing round of fixtures and i was disappointed to be wrong on a few calls but overall i enjoyed the the drama and the excitement of those matches well, Colin, feel free to respond because shots fired, as Ed just said. He had a couple more right than you. Just, just subtly tossed that in there. Um, what was your take on what has been an, I mean, a, a wild tournament so far? Well, first of all, two things. One, Ed's got to apologize to Nigeria because I specifically told him that Nigeria would beat Cameroon. And I gave him very factual reasons, not emotional ones, why Nigeria would beat Cameroon. And Ed still did not. So, Ed, you owe Nigeria an apology before because they've told me that I need to get that off of you before we can revoke or rather otherwise your visa is going to stay revoked. So that's what the, the second thing is I got more than 50 percent. I got I actually got five out of eight, which is not which is not bad at all. So uh, which is more than Ed got. And um, I think um, that's uh, remarkable. I think even for Morocco and Senegal, who kind of have turned things around. But OK, I think Ed and I got about the same um, number, so to speak. But I, I think I got more. I got five out of eight. So that's good. But anyway, I think it's been a remarkable tournament. I think, I mean, look, to be honest, um, you don't see many tournaments that have won. The number of upsets that the Afghan has, the number of uh, drama that's happening, and not, uh, and then of course, let, we haven't even talked about VAR. I mean, mm -hmm. the ref, the officiating at this tournament has been the best. I, I think European referees, uh, Premier League, wherever, need to go to CAF and take lessons on how to make them use VAR properly. They've had got almost all the decisions spot on, and um, there's been very, very few complaints, to be honest. Yeah, the refereeing has been great, and uh, I mentioned the upsets, obviously. We've said a couple different times. The five highest ranked teams by the by the rankings are all out right now. Nigeria remains, after taking down defending champs Cameroon, as the, high, as the best odds in terms of the favorites. When we look forward, we'll get into that, but they are the favorites by the by the bookings. I do want to bookies. I want to talk about Morocco in, in the South Africa match. And Ed, I'll start with you. No, I mean, this one... Ed apologizes. Oh, okay. okay. I, 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 humbly, free. I humbly, I sincerely, <laughs> I formally apologize to all of my Nigerian brothers and sisters. I made a terrible, shocking lapse of judgment. It'll never happen again, I promise. Uh, I, I, I just, I had a momentary lapse. I got it wrong and I sincerely apologize. I hope, I hope we can defeat Angola together. Oh, humble pie okay. feels great. Serving it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you just tipped your hand there. You're not taking Angola in, in the in the quarterfinal match, it seems. But we'll come back to that um, in a minute. Let's let's talk about the Morocco South Africa match because there was that it contained everything with whether it was VAR, missed penalty. I mean, we had all types of stuff going on in that match. Um, Colin, when you look back on it, what was your takeaway? How was uh, Bafana Bafana able to come away with with the victory over a, a team that went to the World Cup semifinal last time around? Oh, yeah, I, I think they did a, they, they played a fantastic game. Um, in fact, Bafana Bafana always have a good record against North African teams. And the reason really is simple. Most North African teams are actually really counter-attacking size, and Bafana are used to dealing with that. So they keep the ball where they are very high, they give, have this very high technical um, ability, and you know they can get very quickly from defense to attack, which is uh, something that they don't, which is why they don't do very well against West Africa teams like Nigeria and so on. But with the North Africans, it's easier for them, and they have beaten Morocco before during the qualifiers. And the Morocco team, um, you know, just w w didn't come to the party, especially considering they were missing um, before, and then of course uh, 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 Hakimi missed that penalty, so it was always going to go downhill for them. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually. I don't want to have to issue any more apologies, but I'm actually disappointed because I really had belief in this Morocco team. They were such a credible side. I thought that their learnings from the World Cup and the way they handled those intense knockout games would make them so much stronger 
for a match like this where they have to overcome a, a, a stubborn obstacle. Uh, as you say, uh, Bufal being absent, Ziyech being absent as well, that, mm -hmm. that denied them the two most creative players in their team, the, the players with a bit of guile, a bit of nuance to kind of break down a defence. They replaced them with direct players who, who were effective to an extent, but that also mean they didn't have the direct players to bring off the bench mm -hmm. to, to change the game uh, as, it, as it went on. Ultimately, I'm disappointed because we're missing some titanic clashes that Morocco would have, would have brought us, and also disappointed that they didn't demonstrate the maturity and the character they showed at the, the, the World Cup. Hakimi missing the penalty, Amrabat getting sent off, just petulance, kind of just a lack of control and lack of composure in midfield. A really uh, ignominious evening for them against Africa. You just touched on something, Ed, and I, I kind of wonder what you think about that. It, when you have when you have upsets, there is drama, there's unexpected things happen. But the best teams that we think don't end up playing each other, or the biggest, maybe some of the bigger teams or some of the bigger players don't play each other. Is that what is better for this tournament at this time to have the upsets and have more parity, or to have some of the bigger teams playing at, at the highest stakes games? Look at what the upsets are causing. Everybody's eyes are tuned onto the AFCO right now. I mean, there's another tournament going on with the AFC, but it doesn't have as much interest as the um, uh, as the AFCON. And why is that? Because of all the upsets. Everybody expected, oh, this is going to happen. It didn't happen. So I think I'd rather have these upsets because what it does is also throws these other smaller teams into the spotlight and makes them, you know, much of a, a more better eye-pleasing proposition because now everybody's thinking, where's the next upset going to come from? And to be honest, right now, I don't even know. I mean, it's hard to predict. So I'd rather have this than um, that. And one more thing to add, I think um, I've also been disappointed at the behavior of our reporters at the um, uh, at the tournament. We had Ghanaian journalists abusing uh, players in the mix zone. We had um, um, uh, an Ivorian journalist going half, you know, naked uh, in the media tribute. And then we had some fighting that went on last night. So uh, I think, yeah, last night. And so I, I did make a complaint to both CAF and um, the AIPS. And the good thing is they've, they've taken action. And I hope that we don't see those things anymore. Yeah, I actually, I actually disagree. Uh, I disagree with Colin's point. The first point there, obviously, I, I hate to see uh, nudity in the press box. But on this first point, I actually really wanted to see those titanic clashes in the in the in the last in the semis, the final. We had three teams who have really proved their greatness already: Algeria in 2019, Senegal at the last Nations Cup, Morocco at the World Cup, and a titanic clash between any of those three would have been mouth-watering. That would have been eyeballs on Africa. And we've got some other great stories, but I'm personally disappointed we won't get to see those uh, heavyweight blockbuster clashes. Okay, let's, let's look. Guys, if you can, pop up the graphic with the quarterfinals again. Let's kind of get into each matchup quickly. Um, you said you don't want, you know, more more upsets are better, Colin. Uh, would you hold your feel if Angola beat Nigeria? What are your thoughts on that one? <laughs> Why put me on that kind of spot? Anyway, um... <laughs> I mean, I'm never ever going to bet against Nigeria. And part of the reason is, I, I mean, there are times when you could bet against Nigeria, but um, not this time. This team is looking better than I thought they would look going into the AFCON. Uh, and I had a chance to speak to some of the players um, yesterday, especially William Trust Ekong. And there was something he said, which is something that we've seen at this time. He said they don't want to have any team out to work them. And that if they don't get have any team out to work them, then their quality will show. And that, that's just been the story of their tournament. So I think that as long as they carry that um, same mentality into the game, it's going to be hard for anyone to beat them, um, especially Angola. Ed? Uh, I think Angola have really, they're, they're the team who have brought players who maybe no one's ever heard of before, who are really kind of holding their own. Uh, guys like Gelson, Gelson Dalla, for example, Mabalulu, players who really have never had the spotlight. So it would be great to see them go up against Nigeria. But I agree with Colin. Uh, I think the first time we've agreed since 2017. I agree with Colin that Nigeria are going to go through. Uh, I think, uh, as he pointed out last time, really strong defence. Uh, once you take the lead in such sapping hot conditions, uh, it's such an advantage knowing that you've got a defence who are going to uh, keep things tight behind you. Yeah, and Nigeria's only allowed a goal in the competition so far. As I mentioned earlier in the show, they are the betting favourite right now to win the whole competition. Angola is the biggest underdog to win the entire competition in terms of their actual matchup. That is the biggest spread in terms of the matchup by the bookies. All right, let's move on to the next game. DR Congo, who's yet to win a game in this tournament, but still are in this position, and obviously eliminating on, on penalties the game before. Um, and they're taking on Guinea. Uh, Carl, we'll start with you again. What is your thoughts on this matchup? Yeah, I mean, I picked DR Congo from the jump when I had, had my bracket uh, done. Um, 
I did get a bit of concern with the way they played and how Guinea um, advanced. But having said that, I, I am still sticking with them. They are going to go through. They've got a really good um, a squad of players. And I think that if they get one goal, um, they'll, they'll, they'll clear it up. Yeah, I agree. I, I really like the, the Congolese uh, attacking options. I mentioned it last time. And uh, we saw even in the last match, uh, Grady Diangana, former West Ham, coming off the bench, looking lively. They've got Silas. They've got uh, Cedric Bakambu. They've got uh, Elia Meshak. They've got Kakuta to come back into the team. Really creative presence in number 10. So that's suddenly a lot of different ways of hurting opponents, of breaking teams down. Uh, so that's that's. Yeah, I think what will give them the edge against Guinea. I would just like to mention uh, Guinea right back Ibrahim Diakite, who was outstanding uh, in their last match against Equatorial Guinea. He plays for uh, Reims in uh, Ligue 1 in France. Uh, one of he's only 20. One of the breakout players for me of this uh, Nations Cup. That's one of the best things about tournaments like the Afcon. These players that do step up onto this like international stage and watching them perform in their club teams, but then also obviously in future international competitions. Um, Let's keep it moving. We're going to go to Mali and Ivory Coast. Before we get to the actual matchup of the games, I mean, there's neighbors, there's history, there's geography. Colin, how, if at all, does that play as Ivory Coast is the host nation here, too? Yeah, so um, I picked Mali earlier on to go through and um, against Senegal. And I thought that Mali would be the ones to get Senegal out because I really wasn't convinced about Senegal. Um, it turned out that, you know, um, I was right in some ways because they got taken out early. Now, I'm going to switch that over now and pick Cote d'Ivoire. The reason I do that is because now, one, they've got a new manager bomb. Um, additionally, they, they're, they're riding a wave of crowd support, of confidence, uh, of the push that they've got from eliminating Senegal. And I think that that's going to just be the, what helps them. I mean, irrespective of whatever happens on the field, that whole boost, that confidence, that self-belief um, in, the, in themselves and uh, the, the effect they had from the crowd is what's going to carry them to um, against Mali. I I would I'm going to make a case that Ivory Coast it's actually one of the most remarkable performances in a tournament by a team that I've ever seen or I think even in the history of football you've got the kind of absolute disaster element of like Brazil 1950 or France in 2010 mm -hmm. getting beaten at home 4-0 but you've also got then the kind of underdog element of like Greece 2004 or South Korea 2002 by actually eliminating the holders when they were dead and buried they've sacked their manager midway through a tournament it's it's like three unbelievable stories kind of rolled into one and i think the momentum they're going to have now after eliminating senegal they've got some decent players like don't forget um this redemption arc is is one of the best afghan storylines possibly ever and i can see them uh defeating mali now and maybe even going all the way to win to be honest because it, it's such a, a remarkable um there's such a remarkable point right now that they can ride this wave all the way to the end that story would be unbelievable. Like, I, I mean, it's it's wild to have a, have a manager change in the third game after a group stage of a tournament and then continue to roll with all the pressure of the home home team as well. That's, that would be crazy if that actually took place. Uh, let's go to the last quarterfinal. Cape Baird uh, taking on South Africa. Where are we at in this? Uh, Colin, you lead us off. Um, I'll be sure about this one. I don't think South Africa will get past this round. I mean, um, they were extremely fortunate to play against, uh, the way they played against them, Morocco, uh, and got past them. Again, like I said, they are used to playing and winning against North African teams. But when they face the physicality and technical skills of the, of West Africa, they tend to fall short a lot of the time. So, and, 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 Cape, and Cape Verde have got the weapons to really, really hurt them. And they've played well, they've scored goals. Um, I think they've been amazing. In fact, for me, I, I, I look at them as if there's an underdog that I think might go on to win this tournament, I think it might be Cape Verde. Ed? Uh, for me, Bafana, I thought Cape Verde against Mauritania, they only won 1-0 against one of the poorest sides in the tournament. And I think their their legs, uh, they, maybe their race is run. Whereas I think South Africa, with also with Hugo Bruce, who's a manager who's actually won the tournament with Cameroon, uh, maybe could give them that extra edge in a knockout game. Evidence Magoffa, a real handful up front, uh, six foot two, uh, powerful, really keeps defenders busy. Great match, hard to call. I'm just going to edge it with South Africa. Okay, we're going to end on a big picture thing because we just touched on it. I mean, let's get to the. We said Nigeria is the betting favorite, just under two to one. Ivory Coast is second at three to one. Mali six to one. DR Congo, Cape DR Congo ten to one. Cape Verde, Cape Verde and Guinea and South Africa twelve to one. Angola at twenty to one. That said, Cape Verde, you just said, Colin, you kind of tossed it out there. You teased it, maybe, maybe, maybe they're in the mix. We're not going to see you guys again, maybe till the final. We've got another round to go, and then we've got we got to get your predictions again. Just give me a winner with the odds and context. If somebody wants to make a little wager here, what would you like to go? I go Nigeria. 
Okay. <laughs> oh, just uh, was that heart or head? What do we got here? Heart or head? Um, a little bit of both. Um, okay. Again, like I said, just from that, seeing what they've done, and also you know listening to the way um, William Trust Ekong and Ahmed Musa were talking, that if they if they keep this spirit of working themselves to the bone uh, and just making sure nobody outworks them, it's going to be hard to beat them. I mean, any team, it's going to be hard for any team to beat them. So if, if, the, if nothing changes and they take the attitude all the way, they're going to get to the final and win it. But there might be a stumble there. So um, from, a, from, a, from a heart perspective, of course, I want, want them to win. From a head, I think if they play the same way they've been playing, they're quite capable of doing it. Ed, you like the favorite? Or you want to take a flyer with us? You mentioned uh, Congo at ten to one, which mm -hmm. is actually seems very generous odds considering they've not lost. They've got Guinea next. Okay, they haven't won it since nineteen seventy four. Um, but at the same time, like I think ten to one seems very generous for a team who are organised, are defensively pretty solid, have just dumped out Egypt, have got as I mentioned before great attacking options. I don't think they'll win it, but I think at ten to one, that's good value and a decent run for your money.